I guess I should just sit down. Um, my name is Kathy Halbrecht, and I have the great pleasure of being the director of the Walker Art Center. I'm, of course, delighted to welcome you all to this an ongoing series called Talking Dance, funded by the Gertrude Lippincott Fund. This is in many, many ways a special evening for us. We're, of course, all anticipating a marvelous performance of the Cunningham Company this Saturday in the Garden at 2.15. We're also, I confess, reveling a bit in the announcement this week of a $1.5 million grant from the Doris Duke Foundation to the Walker's Performing Arts Program. <laughs> but of course, uh, grants such as that don't come just because we love what we do. It comes really from the faith of artists and artists especially, such as Merce Cunningham, who has been here many, many times. So I want to thank him for the Doris Duke grant, too. <laughs> um, Born in 1919 in Centralia, Washington, Merce Cunningham happily has a genetic tie to Minnesota, which I think only partly explains why we've come here to think of this community as his second home since he first appeared in Minneapolis at the YWCA in 1959. In an interview in a marvelously revealing book about Cunningham, choreographed by David Vaughn to Merce's left, Merce spoke of his links to Minnesota and the legacy of his parents. He said, it's true, I think, that both my parents had an instinct for adventure. Both left the middle of the country to come west for their careers. My mother came from Minnesota to teach school. My dad came from Kansas to study law. I once asked him why he hadn't set up practice in a city, Seattle maybe. He said it was a conscious decision because he wanted to be able to do all kinds of law, from homesteading cases to defending murderers. He said he felt he'd be free in Centralia, and knowing his temperament, I can imagine also that he didn't want anybody else telling him what to do, end quote. I imagine Merce didn't want or need anybody telling him what dances to dance or how to organize his artistic career either. He's a man who has changed how dance is made and consequently how it is defined. Cultural institutions need to be partners with artists, sharing the risk as well as the adventure embedded in innovative work. I'm extremely proud to direct The Walker because it has been able to provide Merce and his company with dozens of opportunities in which to chart their own path in association with many of the most influential musicians, filmmakers, visual artists, and computer specialists of our time. Least we forget today the revolutionary and experimental nature of Merce's work then as well as now. Let me read from the first local review in the Minneapolis Tribune of Merce's work in 1963. The critic wrote, three well-mannered anarchists will try to blow up a wall in Minneapolis tonight. The anarchists are choreographer Merce Cunningham, composer John Cage, and painter Robert Rauschenberg. The wall, which they also describe as an ivory tower and a closed door, is the one between art and life. Tickets to this explosive event were $2.50. 35 years and dozens of performances and residencies later, we were able to steal a bit from those anarchists in framing the concept for Art Performs Life, Merce Cunningham, Meredith Bunk, and Bill T. Jones, the exhibition currently on view. Merce apparently was first seen dancing at the age of three in the aisles of church. By 10, he was taking tap lessons. At 16, he was on a vaudeville tour. And at 19, as a student at the Cornish School, he met John Cage, who was teaching composition. In the summer of 1939, Merce attended the Bennington School of Dance at Mills College, where he studied with some of the same faculty, including the poet Ben Bellet, that I did when I attended Bennington. But there our paths diverge. He was immediately offered choices, a place in Doris Humphrey and Charles Weidman's company, a scholarship to Bennington, and a promise by Martha Graham that if he came to New York, he could dance in her company. When he arrived in New York that fall, Martha greeted him apparently by saying, oh, I didn't think you'd come, <laughs> and then set him to dancing in works such as Circus, El Pentatente, 
Punch and Judy, and Letter to the World, for which the uh, critic Edwin Denby wrote, he is in his own way as noble and as touching a dancer as I know, one of the finest dancers in America. In New York, Merce listened to Billie Holiday, acted in a theatrical work by E. Cummings, and attended the School of American Ballet, suggesting the ways in which his talents would cross disciplines, including his 1997 collaboration with Ray Kawakuba, the designer for Comme de Garçon, which resulted in the outsized and inflated costumes for Scenario on view in the final galleries upstairs. Merce never asked a collaborator to illustrate his dance. Rather, like atoms, which form compounds with similar particles of other elements, each artist retains his or her identity. The point of collaboration, he says, is that independence of parts and elements might produce something that can't be known in advance. You tune it to what no one expects. The unexpected, of course, leads us to new ways of seeing the world around us. I remember a few years ago listening to Merce at dinner and thinking this must have been what it was like to learn from Albert Einstein. Here was a man who understood time and space, who knew how imaginative leaps could result in new truths, and taught us before the world postmodern became fashionable that progress was never linear. It's perhaps difficult for any of us to recognize someone we've had the luxury of, or, sorry, the luxury of watching up close as a genius. But at 79, Mercer's work suggests that is the only word which is ample enough to describe the humanity and brilliance of his career. He is the master of American choreography, the one who, like his father, didn't want anyone telling him either what or how to do it. I'm de delighted tonight that we'll have the opportunity to welcome Merce home and to ask him how he does it. We're extremely fortunate, too, to have David Vaughn in our midst. David, a singer, actor, and choreography in his own right, also has served as the archivist for the Cunningham Foundation since 1979. His extraordinary book on the company is available in our shop, and I also want to thank him for his extraordinary efforts in helping us realize the exhibition. I can't think of two better collaborators than Philip Bother, the Walker's Performing Arts Curator, and Philippe Verne, the curator of Merce's section of the exhibition, Art Performs Life. Please do welcome them all. I'd like to thank you all for coming and really extend my warmest welcome and thanks to Merce Cunningham for being with us tonight as well. Um, and I, and I want to start off with a, with a question. Um, for those of you who are wondering, we're going to spend about 45 minutes or so, 45 minutes to an hour talking, and then there will be time for your questions following. But um, I know often you're probably asked about this more than, than anything, um, but we'll get it out of the way in the, at the start. And I wanted to ask you about that period at Black Mountain College um, that has been so viewed now in history as so central uh, a time and uh, such an important um, point in time when, in particular in 1952, you and John Cage and Robert Rauschenberg and Charles Olson, M.C. Richards, David Tudor, created what many view as a seminal turning point in terms of, um, uh, in terms of performance, in terms of really our culture at large. Do you feel like that period has been over mythologized in a certain way? Or do you feel like, in fact, that is accurate, the importance it's given? And, and at the time you were there with your colleagues, did you know what you were doing was going to be viewed as, as, as that Im radically important at, at that time? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, we, um, it was really John Cage, of course. Uh, who had this kind of idea about an evening that we would do in the dining hall at Black Mountain College, which was the only big space, so that after uh, food was served, then the tables could be moved away and the floor swept, and then there could be something else given for the evening. And uh, John wanted to do this kind of... of uh, event, for the lack of another word, it had no name, but it was an evening, 
And as you said, uh, D uh, David Tudor was at the piano and John uh, reading and uh, Robert Rauschenberg was um, with an old wind-up Victrola up on top of a ladder playing those old 78 records, I guess they would have been. And Olson was reading poetry. And M.C. Uh, Richards, I've forgotten what she, everybody did, in other words, what he or she thought to do without reference to what the other person was doing, but also without harming the other person. <laughs> and the uh, audience sat in a sort of triangular arrangements with the point of the triangle going into the center of the hall on four, there were four of them, and there were these um, uh, paths through that you could uh, go through, and, and everything, everything except for what I did was on the outside. And um, I danced and, and threw the, the and around, and also there was a little dog that followed me. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I kept thinking, well, he's probably doing something much more interesting than I do. <laughs> but, and it lasted um, perhaps an hour. I don't remember really. But at the end, then, um, everyone was served coffee. <laughs> and it was uh, simply uh, the experience of people doing what he or she chose to do in the circumstance without, um, so that you had a multiplicity of different uh, things to deal with for, one th for the principal thing, and no one thing was better than anything else, nor was it intended that way, and um, each person had chosen the uh, particular things that he or she would do. Um, and John's idea, as it was also with and carried on in our work, of course, the way we have worked is that um, I, I don't think that we are in any sense political because I'm not that way. I'm don't, not particularly concerned about politics. Uh, but I think that we have for 35 years with the company now, and it began shortly after that experience, a f in a way a form of anarchy because this is the way we work. Uh, we, I ask a composer, or John of course originally uh, would do it, either he himself would compose the work or ask another composer. Um, and, and then when there was a visual possible with it, an artist to ask the artist to do something, but in no sense did I tell anybody what to do or what I thought it should be. I would answer any questions any of them wanted. And uh, uh, John Cage always wanted to know what my structure for the dance was going to be. And since I divided things in terms of time, I could usually tell him, perhaps not specifically, but something about it, and then he would go and make way and make a different structure. So, but then, so the two things coming together could produce something that we would not have experienced uh, if we had maybe decided ahead of time. Um, uh, equally so with, I think, with the visual artists. Uh, there are always certain things about that uh, th that uh, one has to, as Christian Wolff said, once one has to have good faith in this kind of circumstance. Uh, with my work, mostly the dance is occupied by the dancers, and uh, in, I think in the main, almost 100% of the time, the designers with whom I've worked or with whom we've shared this have understood that. And although they have made things uh, that prompted me to th think differently, sometimes in the choreography, um, and the, and the principle always was that we could work together, but as separate identities. Um, there, in the story, I think, is in David's book about antique meat, where I told Robert Rauschenberg, who was uh, going to do the design for the work, that I wanted to have a chair on my back, strapped to my back for one dance, which would be a duet with Carolyn Brown. And Bob said, well, if you, he thought for a minute, I must say, and then he said, well, if you have a chair, could I have a door? And I said, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> because it produces something else. You know, it prompts you to um, 
at least my feeling is it prompts me to think another way, to see an, uh, something instead of saying, oh no, that's not what I want, mm -hmm. uh, not to think that way, but rather wonder if this couldn't produce something that might be uh, lively. Yeah. And, and John's principle in that first work was really that, that each person did whatever he or she did without reference to the other performers. In, in David's book also, he mentioned um, when, I think for Summer Space, when Morton Feldman, you had approached him to compose the music, and he said, well, you know, what am I supposed to do exactly? And I think your comment was, just imagine that you're going to a wedding, and you will oh, know. No, no, no. I, no. No, it's <laughs> yes, Morton. Correct, you've got to... I don't know if you know, ever knew any of you Morton Feldman. <laughs> he was... Uh, I was making the dance with the dance company, and we were in... Uh, <laughs> Um, Connecticut College. Uh, 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 Bob, who was going to make the decor, uh, and the, that beautiful drop, which I peeked at here, it's so marvelous to see it. Um, he um, was in South Carolina, I think, and Marty was in New York. And Marty met a friend, and they asked him what he was doing, and Marty said he was writing a piece of music for a dance for me, and that Robert Rauschenberg was going to make the decor. And the man said, well, the friend said, well, how is it that Merce is in Connecticut and Bob is in South Carolina <laughs> and you're in New York and this could happen? And Marty said, well, it's like this. Suppose uh, your daughter's getting married and I tell you that, um, that, that her, cost, her dress will be by Dior, but she won't see it till the morning of the wedding. <laughs> Does it happen that this meeting didn't work from time to time? That what the visual artist bring or that the musician bring or brought was not what you not expected, but was not you. Yes. Well. Well. First of all, um, simply sound wise, um, since we do not with the dancers, we do not uh, uh, um, in the customary way rehearse with the music. Hmm. That is, it's a separate identity. It brings into the situations things that we would not be aware of. Um, um, and um, uh, although I must say we don't, uh, I don't have any feeling that the dancers are uh, disturbed by this. I suppose we're so used to this kind of working now mm -hmm. that uh, probably in the very beginning, um, it may have been slightly disconcerting. Oddly enough, I, the first, my first experience that I remember very vividly was with Cage when, uh, this is before, this is way back in the 40s. Um, I, I was, um, had made a dance called uh, Root of an Unfocus, a solo, and John was making the music for it, which was for the prepared piano. And um, we had agreed upon a structure within which we would work. And the structure, to put it very simply, was like an, a, 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 he called it a rhythmic structure, but a series of, of uh, lengths of time which were the same, say one to ten, repeated ten times, which gave the quantity of time within which the action would take place. So we knew at the beginning of a phrase and at the end that we could um, have some kind of uh, joining, so to speak. But in between, not at all. So I made the dance, and then uh, finally the time to time came to uh, rehearse, so to speak, with the music. And John played it, and even then, even though all the things were happening which were absolutely no connection with what I was doing, I was amazed uh, the sense of being absolutely sure where I was, at the same time free. And then there were several moments when, and quite, so to speak, by chance, um, the, the sound and a movement came together, and it was so striking. Um, it, it, not, not something we had arranged, but simply happened, like a coincidence in life, you know, that way. And of course, since it was in the structure, it remained that way. And it was always, for me, um, as long as I could do the solo, it was a marvelous experience to dance that. It's the first one I remember so strongly where the, 
relationship between the sound and the dance was both separate and at the same time uh, flex, uh, not fixed, that's the wrong word, but accurate. Right. Really. Yeah. So and, is it really kind of impossible to, in some ways, be disappointed with your collaborators? or to, There's always something that you find that will that come together and challenge. Well, I suppose one could say that, that some things that, but um, since it's an allowance for things to come together, in one sense, uh, coincidental, right. then um, you can say, well, that wasn't a very coinc a good coincidence or not. <laughs> right. but, but, but it's been so uh, amazing to me over the years how things which um, I would wonder about naturally with the music and the dance and the decor. You have the decor here for... Um, uh, ground level overlay that were made by uh, Leonardo Drew, yeah. uh, who's a, um, I, I think a wonderful artist, and he um, had never worked in the theater. And uh, when this dance that I was making, we were wondering about getting someone to make a decor for it, and it was a friend who suggested, uh, uh, had spoken about a young, say the possibility of a young artist, and I had seen Leonardo's work at uh, the home of Barbara Schwartz, mm. and I, which I thought was very beautiful, and I thought of him instant. I thought, oh, I wonder if he would do it. He never worked in the theater. Mm. So he was asked, and he, he was delighted. And he came, he didn't know anything about the theater in that sense. And we talked, and we explained certain things about, practical things about the theater. And he, he wasn't put out off at all. He said, oh, okay, oh, <laughs> no. And uh, um, then he went away and made what he did. And I didn't see it till the afternoon of the evening we were to give the first performance. And I came on the stage for our rehearsal, and there was this very beautiful set, if you want to call it that, hanging up. I thought it was stunning. It gave such a kind of atmosphere to the, to the, to the situation without any defining it. But, and then um, Stuart Dempster, uh, from, who's from Seattle and who <coughs> had worked with us before, and we had asked him through Kosugi whether um, uh, Stuart would do the music for this work, and Stuart was very happy and came. And we were, got, we were getting ready to rehearse, and Stuart was in the pit, and he said, Merce, are you going to do the dance? And I said, yes, we're going to go through it shortly. And he said, well, do you mind if we play the music? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, not at all. It was wonderful. <laughs> I, I think in that sense it's a kind of anarchy, uh, but it's also trust between people that are not that one thing is necessarily better than another, but that by doing it this way with this kind of thinking that you can act this way, then you can act this way. Um, Years ago, I, at Black Mountain College, when the, the following summer, when the, my, the, what David describes as the beginning of my company, <laughs> we were there. I was working on a solo, which, for lack of another title, I simply called Untitled Solo, which had been made through chance operations. Very, it was incredibly difficult to, physically difficult to remember what came next in terms of physical memory, to do it. There was different things for the arms, for the feet, for the head, and all this. And uh, the, it was being done with a piece by Christian Wolf, a piano piece. Well, David Tudor was there that summer to be with us, but also he was uh, rehearsing for a program of his own. So I didn't like to ask him to come and rehearse with us. Uh, so, but finally I was desperate with this and I asked David if he would come. <laughs> and he did what he always did and smiled and said, of course. So he came and we started to, to again in the dining hall that I spoke of earlier. And David would start the, the um, music and I would start to do the dance. And after about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, the first time I remember, I was in dismay. I couldn't remember it. I couldn't figure out which foot and on back. back. David said, well, we do it again. So we started again. We did this about four or five times, and I hadn't gotten too much further. And I sat down in despair. 
And David Tudor got up from the piano, came around and looked at me, and he said, this is clearly impossible, but we're going right ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> and we did. And I found with that philosophy, if that's a philosophy, lots of things happen that may not be exactly what you thought they would, but they always turn out to be something lively and something interesting. <laughs> Do you find that um, it was interesting your story about um, how you came across Leonardo's work in recent years when you identify new collaborators? Is there a do you have a gut instinct? Is, do people bring you samples of work? How, how do you how do you find those those either composers or or designers that uh, artists that you would like to work with? Well, um, the, I'm trying to think. Actually, with with. Um, um, scenario, the, the work with the, the Comme des Garçons, that was uh, through um, David Guillon, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, 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 David Guillon, who was then in our office as one of the office staff persons, uh, had some connection with uh, the Comme des Garçons of Ray Kawakuba, and he asked me if I would be interested in working with, under this circumstance, and I didn't know anything about, frankly, about Comme des Garçons, but they explained that it was who she was and what the situation was, and that she was interested in this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just pursued. And I, in my usual way, I um, went ahead and worked on a dance. And I didn't really think about the costumes, although I knew that there were going to be the, some way these exaggerations. I didn't know exactly but I didn't make the dance with that in mind. I, I thought that whatever they did, they would be, a, in a way, an extension, something uh, not, not again, not to my feeling, necessarily something wrong, but something that added something else, which was not possible, which would not have happened otherwise. It's, it's so, um, I found in, in looking at, at uh, your history and, and um, following your work that it's, it's so incredible to me how you will consistently challenge yourself and your company with new, new hurdles and new, maybe hurdle is the wrong word, but you must have a remarkable group of dancers, um, both in previous years as well as now, who will go with you on the challenges, say with the uh, Carme de Gasson um, costumes. There, there are new, um, it seems, uh, New, new uh, challenges each with each new work that you that you open yourself up to those possibilities and your company goes with you. Have you ever found that the company has said, "We can't go there with you"? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Getting a little disturbed, and then I back off and just come around the other way. <laughs> Usually, I. I, I push things, uh, I'm trying to learn not to do this because it isn't necessary and I push things too quickly and it's very hard sometimes in a recent work particularly which is the, the complexity of the, of the movements, um, it takes a while to absorb right. and it takes me a while to figure them out. I work with the dance computer right. a great deal that way but still it takes me a long time and then to translate it to them and to expect them to um, get it rapidly, but I not have noticed over the last several years with this new complexity that there, they, what they, what was difficult originally is not difficult now, mm -hmm. and some of them, and almost all of them, really pick things up uh, quite, quite f much faster now. Mm -hmm. I, th I really think it's like the children with computers. Mm. How does it affect the way you, you've been working, the computer? You, you've been working with the computer since almost 1989? Uh, so yes, you, yes. And how does, it, uh, mm. how does it affect the way you choreograph and the relationship with the, with the dancer? Because I, I would assume that it's totally different to you know, starting with a computer and explaining the dancer. Yeah. Do you show the dancer what you're doing on the computer or is yeah. it like your, <clears throat> your notes and it's for yourself? I work out uh, phrases of movement on the computer um, using incidentally chance operations in, <laughs> with the computer figure and uh, one can make f f with, with life forms which is the uh, um, system I have worked with or have worked with the most certainly. Um, you, can, you have a figure 
<clears throat> when they sequence editors, it's called, and you can make phrases of any length, but the computer doesn't like it if they get too long because then it has to stuff them in. <laughs> anyway, so I, I try not to do that too much. But, but, and you can design, you see, each pose, each position as it comes along, you can make it what it is, and then the computer, through the timing, will go from one to the next. And what you see then, or at least to my eye, I kept seeing all kinds of things which obviously were there, but I'd never seen them before. So I, I, using it from that point of view, I thought, well, can I find a way with this kind of uh, movement um, activity to give it to the dancers? So in the beginning, I would work it out in the computer and then try to remember a little bit of it and run out and give it to them. <laughs> Come back. The computer is in a very small room and it's on a, a regular size screen, so it would be impossible for the dancers to come in and look. There is, a, I think, a, a, um, in the making, as I understand, a, a video output which, say, would make it possible to translate the movement to, to a bigger screen so that the dancers in the studio could see it. But anyway, this is the way we've worked. Well, in the beginning, how to make this kind of complexity uh, and really translate it from what I was thought was there to them so it makes some kind of physical sense. You couldn't, if you counted it in the old-fashioned sense, or which to me now is old-fashioned, <laughs> um, it it's stiffened it all. So that you, it lost its what was so astonishing about the way on the computer it went from one thing to another in those, a marvelous way to my eye. So I tried to find other ways. Well, as usual, I began to give exercises in class, um, these uh, on a simpler level, but to see a way to just begin to get it across to them, mm -hmm. so that that uh, I could make it clear enough so that they could see it. The, the, um, uh, they get more complex because I see more things. I'm working on a new piece now, and, and um, just yesterday, we, we, uh, what, I have, what I do working on a new work is to try to find with these new movements a way to get them to the dancers. Uh, that takes a while because they're extremely complex, but at the same time extremely precise. And the, the dancers, uh, well, you have to rehearse them like you do anything. You have to work at it. Well, um, I find, though, that they pick them up so much quicker than earlier. Because their eye, their, their eye uh, sees it. This, the new piece that you mentioned, um, that was a, a brief part was shown at Jacob's Pillow a few weeks ago, and um, the Walkers has been involved with, through the National Dance Program in in supporting. Um, we'll be seeing next year at Northrop Auditorium in the year, well, actually in the year 2000. And it seems that that technology that you're using for also the installation, the 3D computer technology versus life forms, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. That actual technology is stems from the dancers' own bodies with sensors placed in different places. And the computer, there's a sensory um, process that actually picks up their own movement, translate that back into the computer so you can store the memory and use that. Do you see that as a sort of, as a kind of opposite approach than what Life Forms was, where you basically No, no I think or? to me it's, it's, it's an uh, addition. Uh -huh. I, I can see it as an addition. Uh, Life Forms, I think, already is, uh, in Simon Fraser, where they, where they work at it, uh, is already trying to uh, incorporate elements of this in their work, and, and uh -huh. I, I can see no reason why not. Hmm. That I think, you see, it's, it's a totally, it's so new, this, this whole thing of having a visual dance notation, a visual da that way. Um, but the instant I saw life forms, I thought, but this is the way, obviously, dance notation huh. should go. Um, because there is a direct connection between 
the dancer looking at this figure, doing a figure, as it is when a dancer sees a teacher give a phrase yeah. or a movement, or the choreographer. It's direct visual connection. That's yeah. what struck me from the beginning. That so you feel life forms may solve the great dilemma of dance notation? Well, it's not, not tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. But it's, it's on its way toward it. I don't mean only life forms. I think that uh, the hand-drawn space is the one I call right. biped. Uh, that, and I... I think, for instance, the work that uh, um, uh, <clears throat> in Frankfurt um, Billy has done. William Forsyth? Yes, for, yeah, yes yeah. that. And um, not long ago, someone sent me um, something which I tried to read through. It was so complicated I couldn't. But I realized it was somebody looking at the idea of, of putting visual dance or movement on, um, on in technology in another way. Mm. So it's clear. It's so clear that that's the way it's going, uh, and I and I it's it, I can't see that there would be any reason why it shouldn't do that because the technology is so visual and so is dance. You that's what you do with the as You look at it. Yeah. Yes. You have, you, you you love this technology because you when you when we when we, looking at your work. So it's my English. Looking at your work, it seems that you start so early, and to be involved in technology, either it was video or music or this notation. When I think I read, maybe it was in your book, David, that early in the 60s you were already dreaming of a machine we can produce this 3D uh, notation. Oh, but that is that the maybe stick so. figures? Um, I don't. I th uh, Merce was thinking of it. Yeah, it? I, th yeah I, I think um, he was thinking of it. <laughs> what? No, I think I think it's it, it's another text that he wrote that about um, uh, about dance hmm. notation and saying that it was unsatisfactory, hmm. but from his point of view, hmm. but he felt that uh, uh, possibly through a com uh, computerized hmm. possible hmm. it, it, it could be possible, and of course that's what r really has happened. Yeah. I think it's still, uh, considering the complexity of movement of any kind, even with one being moving, and then if you add that the, the actual thing is still in, in its uh, beginning, but I, I, the technology advances so rapidly, and what has happened, in, even in the years that I've been working at it, is quite clear that that's where it will simply go. It doesn't mean that... Uh, symbolic notations couldn't be used, I think that eventually there could be a, a, a joining mm. of the two things in a way which amp would amplify both of them. Does the whole, does the, the onset of, um, of a mass cultural use of computers um, give you a sense of hope or promise or does it give you a sense of fear about, it seems like it's, it's such a turning point and people in our society are feeling one or the other way, and it seems like you were able to use, utilize it as a tool. But I'm curious if, if our computer age is giving you a sense of, of loss around live performance or a sense of hope around what it could oh, be. Oh, no, I, don't, I never think one thing is going to uh, uh, be better or whatever than another. We should have both. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Uh, when I take these things uh, that I put on the computer it out to the dancers, I can see quite clearly that uh, they change because human beings are doing it. Right. But that's like uh, you have an instrument of any kind and then someone plays it and that person brings something out of it that somebody else does in another way. Yeah. And that I, f I find that all uh, just uh, perfect, enlivening. It, it's, uh, it seems a richness there. Right. You've said in the past that um, when you start on a new piece, you, often it comes from the seeds of the last piece that you just finished. Um, do you find, and that almost in some ways, it's, there's a kind of a, a steady stream where the pieces are all connected. Are there other sources of inspiration that you have, or do you find pretty much that the, really when you finish a work, you, there's some challenges left there that you'd like to explore further, or do you find that other parts of life um, inspire you in terms of just taking on taking you in another direction with your next work. 
versus... Oh, I think, yes, I think yeah. anything can. Yeah. I, don't, I, I mean, if you're lucky, you turn the corner and, and something else. And right. No, I, 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 I think that I, mostly it's movement, because that's been my life and it's what I do. But, uh, but um, there's so many th things now, uh, there probably always were, but there's so many things now visually and audibly <laughs> that attack you, and so to speak, from, yeah. <laughs> from every single angle. And that can... Uh, uh, I was looking out the window. I live in New York. In When I first moved to where I live, it was an empty area. All the buildings were empty, and I was up on the top floor with one or two other people who lived in the other apartments. And all the buildings around were totally empty. Since then, it's become a shopping mall. <laughs> and uh, so I, I looked out the window. There, uh, Sunday, was it Sunday, I think? I was um, uh, home working on the computer, not the dance computer, but, a, but my regular kind. And suddenly the sky got very dark. And it happened so, so quick. It was that big rainstorm. It's Monday. Yeah. Monday, yeah. huge, uh, absolutely dark. And the light looked yellow outside. So, yeah. so I sat there looking out the window instead. And then it started to pour rain. And all these people who were rushing in and out of Bed Bath and Beyond and the <laughs> Navy building with these big bundles all had to back up against the building to try to get on. There was no awning, but and all pushing and yelling and <laughs> everything. I thought so. I, I stood and looked at that for a while. I thought, That's right. Oh, and then there was also a woman with a dog, and the, she kept trying to pull the dog in. And it, it was on a leash, of course, and, but it kept going out, you know, it was entertaining. So, so that uh, the, the, instead of being put off by all this, I had a, a show. <laughs> is that something you can use? When you look at this thing and watch this thing, is that something you can use in the way you, you produce dance? Well, particularly what the dog did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'll look for the, the next piece, having people moving back and forth. The, um, the, a few weeks ago, when I had a chance to see the company at the pillow, and we talked a little bit afterward, it struck me, and it stuck with me, when you mentioned, just kind of out of the blue, that about nature and your relationship. Nature has inspired so much of your, of your, so many of your pieces. And you mentioned that you've, you're sick and tired of people talking about nature as being chaotic, that actually nature is perfect and it's man that's chaotic. I wondered if you could ex explain, explain that. A well, we, we say nature is chaotic when it doesn't fit the way we think it should go. But what it's doing is doing what it's doing. And, it's, and it has evolved this marvelous... Uh, if we just get off the planet for a while, I think maybe you could come back for <laughs> me. It's evolved this extraordinary ecological way of survival. Right. The, and when you read about what the birds have done in order to do this, or, the, or, or all kinds of animals, or what, or, or, or the kinds of ways they've had to simply to keep on going, even though we thwart them and so on, it seems to me that we are the people who are chaotic mm. in relation to the whole system of the way the world thought it worked, that we are the ones who are making a mess out of it all. Mm -hmm. and, and just because it won't obey what we think has produced this terrible problems we have now mm -hmm. with, the, with the ecological thing. And, and the, uh, I, I read magazines about the wildlife and, and I take them on the airplane because the only magazines there are golf and money and, <laughs> and things. so I read this and then I finish it and then I leave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there was a beautiful thing about whales. Um, that that the um, about the music and the singing that whales do. Um, and they were, and the the uh, people interested in this have been trying for many years to find out more about it, and then the arm. It turned out the military had many um, 
in deep oceans, particularly around the United States, um, set up some kind of uh, set up to pick up sound, which was to identify foreign s submarines. Well, after all that changed, then they didn't have any use for this. And apparently, a, um, a, a one of these environmental people heard this and asked what it did, since it was secret before, <laughs> and they let him do this. And what he heard were whales. <laughs> and he heard the singing of whales, and and he began to realize that as he went from one of these things to the other, that the song was different, enough different, but it was the same whale. So over th thousands of miles, that they can hear this. So now the uh, the they, the military have left let them have some of these, the ones that are left. So they are trying to deal with the whale, with the way the whales survive. How do they survive when they go from way up in the Arctic to all the way down to wherever they go? <laughs> and uh, I remember in the work of. Uh, that we do call Ocean. David Tudor did uh, um, electronic music and it included the, uh, the singing of whales. And I kept, now I began to understand you know, how he figured out, how, first of all, how to get it, and then how to, how to use it. How long have you been working with David Tudor? How long did you work with him? Uh, he, we, well, at the first time really that we worked was at that summer in Black Mountain in mm. 52, really, mm. and then 50 on, and then he worked with us for so many years with the company. And um, um, <laughs> I think he was uh, not only an absolutely remarkable musician, he was an extraordinary man. Yes. So amazing, so unexpected and so interesting. <laughs> almost anything he dealt with. Um, I, I miss him, I miss some, something about that kind of uh, spirit he had and his devotion and the way he worked with us. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, um, he would uh, make a new piece for us, and of course we never heard him, any of it until the evening of the show, and we would be rehearsing in the afternoon and David would be sitting in the pit working out the sounds that he was going to use. And I began to realize some, some time ago that every once in a while he'd look up. He didn't want us to realize he was looking up, but he was trying to see what the dance was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd go back working. <laughs> and then that evening this sound would appear. <laughs> we have up in the, Philippe was able to, uh, put as part of the gallery show, Molly Davis's uh, installation. Oh, the ins oh, it's wonderful. The, yeah. the where he where he works on the music for yeah, Ocean. Sick, yeah. Oh, it's very beautiful. Oh yes, marvelous. Yeah. That's yes. beautiful. It looks like uh, when you look at that, it looks like uh, a kid's installation. It was what I was very amazed when you're working on the show and looking, listening to all the music which were produced for your work. That how, how much you've been supporting of this kind of new music, which was. I guess when you start working but with that music, it was understood as noise. And you know, it's still from, I've seen people in the galleries that still have some difficulties listening to this music. How did you manage to keep working with electronic music for so long? It was a, a very, because it was a very early commitment. The, um, it goes way back, of course, when I began with John Cage, but I really, always wanted to work with mu music of the time I live in, um, with composers who were composing things uh, which were, um, uh, in, se in that sense, contemporary. And with a Cage, of course, um, right from the start, his, uh, his musical sense was so enormous but from some other angle. <laughs> and uh, so astonishing his, uh, um, the first, one of the first things that struck me was his rhythmic sense. I remember in, uh, at the Cornish School, when he would play the piano for the dance classes. He wasn't a very good pianist, John, but, <laughs> yeah, man. but his, you could realize his remarkable rhythmic uh, sense even then and then always working with him, in, even with these um, 
new ways with the rhythmic structure and eventually simply where he, he would make it the he would make the piece which started when we began and stopped when we stopped but i was always struck by that and of course his sense of sound using sounds which were not using conventional sounds but in a totally different way and then using sounds which uh, any sound which could be used as music mm. and uh, I, I, I always wanted to have uh, contemporary composers. And of course, working with the people with whom I worked, then we began to meet others, naturally. Mm. And I've always found that more interesting. Could you comment on, the, uh, on Saturday, when we see the event in the garden, the music will be performed by and created by Kosugi, your current music director, and Christian Markley, and Jim O'Rourke. And I wondered if you would want to tell us anything about... I know one other time, I think, at Lincoln Center, they did the music a few weeks ago. And yes. Just how, yeah. how, it, how it went and oh, what, it was what we should expect. Oh, wonderful. Um, both Jim O'Rourke and Christian Markley are in the rock world. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, Kosugi knows them and asks them. Uh, it was first Jim O'Rourke. And then Mark Clay, uh, a Christian came, and he was also, I think, Burlington, another place. Yeah, right. Yeah. Was, yeah. Right, right. And I, I think they, because they're, they are very good musicians, and they hear sound in a different way. And they use sound in a way which is not, again, not conventional. Is Christian using the turntables and records? Yes, and, yes, yeah. yes, 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 S yes. And snippets of little pieces of opera and other yeah, records. Yes, and, yes, and, yeah. yes. Yeah. But such, it's such a marvelous sound. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing I guess I got from Cage to begin with, and certainly with David Tudor, the, the way that sound could be produced, uh, new sounds could be used, they could be produced in different ways, and they could be used as compositional, in compositional uh, procedures in different ways. Mm -hmm. And that, it's, uh, that struck me as being uh, something that I, the way I work. The, could you um, mention about, we're going to see an event, you've done many events here in Minneapolis over the years, and, uh, and it seems like 30 years ago when you first created, or more than 30 years ago in Vienna, first did the event, it was out of uh, a need. Uh, uh, like so often your innovations came out of a logistical requirement of a company on the road and you didn't have enough space to do the piece fully. And since that time, it seems to have become, a, give a really much more of a way to recontextualize older work and kind of enliven it for you, rather than, my sense is that you'd rather not just repeat a work that's maybe from the repertoire, that you're able to then put it in a different context and create it in a different way. Is that how the events are serving your interests? Yes, these that's days? part of it. <clears throat> um, yeah. They are, uh, uh, in the beginning, or were, <clears throat> for a long time, given in places where one could not easily do a regular program, say, of three uh, repertoire dances. Um, then we began to play in, to play them in other places, in theaters. And, but we kept the idea of playing in non-conventional places always mm -hmm. uh, as a possibility. Um, the one in Damrush Park, right. the, the, um, well, it was on a platform yeah, that way. And <clears throat> I liked the whole experience that very much that evening. The, it was a perfectly beautiful summer night in New York. And we started in light with the sunset and ended in moonlight. Mm -hmm. And the um, music was by uh, Kosugi and, and Jim O'Rourke and Christian Markley, and it was, I thought, very beautiful. And also something for, for me, which I, I really liked very much. Um, it, the, the concerts are free. They're the summer, yes, as, as right. tomorrow, as Saturday, and uh, so that anybody in New York can come. And um, it's very flattering, but uh, the woman who <laughs> brought us there said that there were 7,000 people. Mm. Um, it's not so much the number, that's fine, I'm not objecting, <laughs> but it's the fact that people from every kind of strata came. Every, every, that's, that, it's like theater, that's what I always think theater, and I think dance is theater, is part of theater as anything else. And that, 
That I, I really li- I like. Well, we once did uh, that event in uh, San- Piazza San Marco. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, in Grand Central Grand Station. Central. Yeah, yeah. And yes. here you did something at the... Here, I guess in Minneapolis, in a, on a basketball field? Yes, yes in the, the Target, yeah. target, yeah, sport, target Center. Target Sports Center, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, in the well, audience. That's part of the Fluxus um, hmm. show. Yeah. show yeah. here. Yeah. 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 I think they call yeah. it Fluxorama. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, so you over there, I was working uh, through the galleries, and there were uh, some people sitting in front of, there was uh, three TVs with video, and I was uh, watching them watching TV, and one of them said, oh, it was uh, Merz by Merz by Peck, and someone said, oh, it looks like MTV. What do you think about that? <laughs> that is, <laughs> because when you start doing this TV clip, it was there is the was it a need to reach more people or the idea to be in, included in something which belonged to popular culture or oh no that was no. Namjoon that's <laughs> Namjoon <Okay. laughs> yeah. no he asked us to do something so uh, I did it <laughs> no no it was it was whatever he wanted. <laughs> The, um, the, when you when you you know, thinking about um, now at this event that on Saturday, um, in some ways the way you've so elegantly stated that you view your work almost as an extension of life, that the wings sort of go away and the theater opens up, and that in some ways the company is performing almost a representation of what of what life is uh, on stage. And d- in that sense, do you find that when a, when you're outdoors, the company's performing? say, on Saturday in the midst of a sculpture garden, the sun is there, the sky is there. Um, do you find that in almost the context philosophically fits better for you than actually in the controlled sense of a, of a proscenium theater with set lighting and you mean the control? The event. The event. Or just uh, uh, yes. the you know, work in general, um, yes. just the way it sits um, in the world. Uh, um, I, well, I think that that was the original way it was done in Vienna, mm-hmm. in an open plat- uh-huh. platform that way, so that in the sense that's what it comes from. <clears throat> but, um, you know, with a dance company or a performing company, somebody, somebody offers you a job, and it's better to say yes than no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> So when so you'd rather be in a theater, really? But or, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. I'm thinking of the events. I yeah. would rather be, uh, I think, in an open situation uh. if they're a ch- choice that uh. way. Uh. But when Benedict Pell, who has so often brought us to France, um, uh, asked if we could do an event in the those Teatro Italian, the small opera houses that are over France, which are which are smaller versions of the large one in Paris. Um, I thought, I thought, well, okay, all right, we just, we will think of it for what it is. And when we do them there, we don't use any wings, the same thing. It, right. it is a theater, it's like a small opera house, huh. but we simply leave it all open huh. the same way, not, not simply as a, as a sort of um, idea, but rather it opens the space. Mm. No matter how small the theater is, if you do that, it opens it out, just not uh, just for the eye and for the dancers. Right. It gives a little more uh, op- uh, freedom for them. It's really practical. Mm. Uh, well, you know, we've reached that time where I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to ask some questions as well. And so we'll continue our conversation unless you have some questions that you'd like to ask. So why don't we see who's out there. Yes. I'd like to ask if there's a time uh, early in your life where when you began to realize that you were fascinated with movement or there any particular experiences when you saw when you were out in nature that things resonated for you where you began to get um, what you were about. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Uh, the question was, was there a time that he remembers the early, almost the earliest time that he first was connecting with movement and thinking about it, how it resonates? And I, I think in general, I must have always wanted to be in the theater. I don't know why. There's no reason for that. It's just, but um, there was a, a woman in the small town I grew up in named Mrs. Barrett who ran a dancing school. And she would give a yearly program with her students, 
doing uh, multiple forms of tap dances, different and Scotch tap, and I, they were they were quite extraordinary actually. And the first one I ever saw, I, I must have been 10 maybe, I don't know, I asked my mother if I could go to this. And uh, since um, Mrs. Barrett and my mother both went to the same church, it was all right. <laughs> so so uh, I remember the little kids, like I was, doing all these little dances. But what I remember really <laughs> was Mrs. Barrett. She came out on the stage in black patent leather shoes and white pantaloons and a yellow dress, flowered dress, like something out of a southern, old southern musical, you know. And she was swinging Indian clubs, you know what that is. <laughs> and talking all the time. All the people in the audience were, were friends, her uh, parents of the children, and she was talking and walking around, and she kept the talking going and put the Indian clubs down at one point and put something up over her skirt, which I later figured out was a huge rubber band, got up on her hands and walked around the stage still talking. <laughs> well, I was caught. I mean, there's no question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we've reached that time where I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to ask some questions as well. And so we'll continue our conversation unless you have some questions that you'd like to ask. So why don't we see who's out there. Yes. I'd like to ask if there's a time uh, early in your life, Merce, when you began to realize that you were fascinated with movement or there any particular experiences when you saw when you were out in nature that things resonated for you where you began to get a um, what you were about? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Uh, the question was, was there a time that he remembers the early, almost the earliest time that he first was connecting with movement and thinking about it, how it resonates? And I, I think in general, I must have always wanted to be in the theater. I don't know why. There's no reason for that. It's just, but um, there was a, a woman in the small town I grew up in named Mrs. Barrett who ran a dancing school. And she would give a yearly program with her students doing uh, multiple forms of tap dances, different, and Scotch tap, and I, they, were, they were quite extraordinary, actually. And the first one I ever saw, I, I must have been 10, maybe, I don't know, I asked my mother if I could go to this. And uh, since um, Mrs. Barrett and my mother both went to the same church, it was all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I remember the little kids, like I was, doing all these little dances. But what I remember really <laughs> was Mrs. Barrett. She came out on the stage in black patent leather shoes and white pantaloons and a yellow dress, <laughs> flowered dress, like something out of a southern, old oh, southern musical, you know. And she was swinging Indian clubs, you know what that is. <laughs> and talking all the time. All the people in the audience were, were friends, her uh, parents of the children, and she was talking and walking around, and she kept the talking going and put the Indian clubs down at one point and put something up over her skirt, which I later figured out was a huge rubber band, got up on her hands and walked around the stage still talking. <laughs> well, I was caught. I mean, there's no question. <laughs> I, I, that, it was so vivid and so... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, when you would find uh, an artist, um, say if they wanted them to build a backdrop or just a set in general, did you give them free reign in whatever, or did you ask them to experience with a certain color, use a certain color? A no, medium, uh, I I give them within what within our uh, the situation that we in which we work. 
for instance, the theater, there are certain things about a building that one has to think of, and the fact that ordinarily the dance needs the space. Other than that, no, I don't, I try to do to, to, uh, as little as possible. But the designer as the composer can come and look, um, watch us and ask questions and nothing like, it's nothing like that. It's only to allow as much independence on the part of each of the, of the artists so that the result uh, ca can be something unexpected, some, uh, like a discovery. That's great. <laughs> Way over on the side. Um, do you choose by a certain criteria the dancers who join your company, or do they come to you through a certain system? How does that come about? The question was, how, do, how can you become a member of Merce's company? <laughs> I think. Well, well um, I think most of the time now, um, I see them in the classes in the studio in West Beth in New York. Uh, and uh, they come th through that. Occasionally, sometimes, um, um, Someone tell we, for instance, uh, so often we need the difficulty with male dancers. They are difficult to find because there aren't that many, and my work isn't easy. So that you usually you have to train for it. I think uh, even if you are trained other ways, you also have to train something about what we do, or it doesn't work. So that they always have to. I some, we somehow have to see them in the classes and, and then through workshops and, and that kind of situation. But you don't f do formal auditions necessarily. Uh, for, when you have an open slot in the company, you don't necessarily hold an audition. You, um, you <clears throat> well, um, Robert Swinston, who, who is my assistant, uh, had a very brilliant idea because um, uh, getting um, male dancers is difficult. So he thought of having this workshop this summer, which was offered free to uh, male dancers. Hmm. Um, and he gave them um, movements out of a scenario, I think mainly. And uh, there were 27 the first day and uh, 16 the second. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they stayed. And it was very difficult for most of them. They couldn't, and even uh, dancers who are uh, very well trained but the, the complexity of the rhythm and the, the suddenness of changes of uh, body movements in ways they're not used to were very, uh, uh, were hard. And one of them, who is also a, <coughs> a Laban, uh, and, and apparently quite skilled Laban notator, uh, fr he comes from uh, Ohio, and um, he said he wasn't sure he could put these movements in the Laban because huh. of the complexity. I'm th I, th I think it probably could be, but you have to jump again. Right. You know, yeah. I know when a Summer Space, by the way, was notated in uh, Laban by Maggie Jenkins from mm. uh, um, uh, San Francisco, but she said there are things then that it didn't have in it that, that she would need to have figure figure out for it to get summer space. Since then, it has added things not not because of summer space, but just because of right. of the changes in the whole dance scene. Huh. What's happened when a sorry when a, a, a major dancer leaves a company? I would think that after Karen Brown left, it's a, you have to you know start the work again. Oh with yes, you just else. begin. I, it's sad. I don't mean to say it that way, but but I over the years I just think well, what can I do now? And not think about what then, but rather what can I do now? Yes, up in the back. It seems like one of your legacies will also be that people perpetuate your technique and talk about this college which is Cunningham, that person which is Cunningham. If you were to be happy with what you saw people teaching, how would you, there's a little extension of what you said, um, what would you like to see as? In that class, if someone is teaching Cunningham technique, what would you hope that they would do? Uh, well, I think that's a difficult question to answer, because I think for anybody, but certainly for me, because um, although my technical work has not radically changed since the beginning, that is the kind of things I thought were essential 
for the body to have. There have been additions over the years which um, people who at some uh, who have studied at a certain point, they go away and teach it, teach what they know. In the meantime, something has been added to to the work because I saw another possibility. So that the technique ha is both in one sense the same, but is still also fluid. So I don't think there's a way to answer that and say it, this is what should be taught. I don't think that it's like codifying an animal, you know, it doesn't work that way. I don't, I don't at least I don't feel that way. I think it gets static. So that uh, I do think that if one understood not just about my ideas about technique, but what technique for a technique for dance somehow needs by its nature, that one could make one's own. It's, it's not. It's not. I chose the way to to uh, to uh, um, use technical means to arrive at making the dances. I didn't set out to make a technique to have one. I've, that's why it has not, as I say, not radically changed. But there have been additions to it in complexity, mainly, that I thought thought were possible. That, and I wanted to try and see if I could put them in, rather than making a decision that this is what it should be and that it should stay that way. I think dance is like water or anything else, it's fluid. And, and the best way to feel about it or to work at it is to every day. I think if I see some, I yesterday gave them a little step to my company, which was uh, not too difficult. I didn't think, and I managed to show it to them. <laughs> but it took quite a while to, to sort of get, get it because of the, what you had to do, get up in the air and then what you did with your foot after you got up in the air. Mm -hmm. and, then when, and then what you did with your body while you're doing all of this. Would, would you almost rather that people didn't say they taught Cunningham technique or that, they, that there wasn't this kind of um, extension of, of, you know, people do define your technique as a certain use of the torso in, in a certain way and a certain line that is used. And do you think that's Cunningham circa a certain point in time, which may not be what Cunningham technique is now because um, you've developed? I, 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 in a way, but yeah. I'm, I'm delighted if I've made things that are useful. I don't, uh -huh. but, um, but, um, I think that you're dealing with the human body and it, it functions a certain way. At the same time you want to, or I do, did, and still do, want to push those possibilities. Um, at the same time not, not, not destroy. And I'm also continually concerned with a feeling that there's always something else, which there is. Um, and how can I get at it? So that rather than thinking that a technique should be fixed, if I come upon something that I think would be useful, uh, I try to, um, I used to work at it myself, now I try to get to find a way to give that to the dancers. So it can enrich the, the, the uh, situation. As for codifying, I, you could say, well, you stand up or you, stand on one leg or the other leg, or there are only five <laughs> ways to jump, you know, and all the, those things are very clear because of the human body. But what you do with all of that, what you do um, from moment to moment or from day to day is what's really interesting. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering, when was the last time that you danced professionally, and what was your decision around when you decided that you would stop dancing? Oh, David, do you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> the question was, when was the last time um, that Merce Cunningham danced, and well, what was the, the decision? The last time you did your solo spot in one of the events was in Prague. Oh. In the summer of last year. But um, no announcement was made, least of all to the people who work with you. This, <laughs> <laughs> this was the last time you were going to do it. I mean, we just sort of figured it out. But I mean, I, I wouldn't put it past you to do it again. <laughs> well, I danced the other evening at the party. Well, that's true. <laughs> and I missed it. 
<laughs> Are there, yes. Um, do, do any of your pieces have like a meaning or a story behind that you'd like the audience to figure out or piece together? To, the question was, do any of the pieces have a story or a meaning behind that, that he'd like the audience to, to walk away with? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that, I think that uh, a movement by itself it has, I, I, mean, I mean, don't even want to use the word meaning, has such life, can have such life to it that it doesn't need anything else. It can have other things, but it doesn't need it. Um, if you watch the particular pleasure of an, well, I will look at my cats, as David once said. The 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 way they move, I don't, I don't know what they're thinking. I ask them, but they don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a pleasure to watch. It's a, a, a deep pleasure. Are there others? Yes. In um, you mentioned your cats, and earlier you mentioned the dogs. Have you taken inspiration from women from animals in the past? For past well, the difficulty with cats and dogs is, of course, they have four legs. <laughs> we only got two. That's our great problem, you know. Once we stood up off, to, off of four and got on to two, that made a very severe limitation about movement. But on the other hand, given all the limitation, there, it's always possible to find something new with it. Not that I'm going to find it, but I mean just in general. I, I figured there always, there always has to be something new. It's like, like invention. It's like the human mind is c continually concerned one way or another with, with what are the possibilities now. And in my realm it has to do with movement. Yes? What was it like working with Martha Graham? Well, she was a marvelous theater person, uh, Graham. Um, I, the few, I wasn't in a great many pieces, of course, but I remember the moments with her on the stage were, were quite, really wonderful. Um, and I, <clears throat> it wasn't until I left that company and, and saw it later that I realized that she wasn't very tall. <laughs> that I, when I, I, I never was conscious of you know, working with her. The, of the difference in height, it never occurred to me that that was so, because of her uh, strength on the stage was, was extraordinary. Yes, in front. Are your pieces in any other companies' repertoire? You answered that the question. <laughs> Are his yes. pieces in other companies' repertoire? Yes, many. Um, uh, American Ballet Theatre did duets for a while. Um, the Paris Opera, well, Merce in fact choreographed a piece for the Paris Opera in the 70s, um, which w we do a little bit of in some of the events, but it, that was a piece made, made for another company. And uh, a couple of times Merce has made a piece for another company that has gone into, uh, into our repertory, like Arcade, which was originally done for the Pennsylvania Ballet, and then we did it, and then Breakers was done for the Boston Ballet, and we did it. And um, a lot of a lot of times, um, we uh, something that uh, several former members of the company do for us now is to go around staging Mercy's pieces for other companies. Like Kathy Kerr is, uh, does that, and Susanna Heyman Chaffee, who now lives in Italy, has staged pieces there. And um, Robert Swinston and Jeannie Steele just this year did uh, um, August Pace for the Rombert Company in London. It's quite a lot of it goes on. And I bet it doesn't bother you at all when you see how different it looks. On well, well, often I don't see it, <laughs> but, but, uh, but uh, it's true. I think I, I, <clears throat> I think people are different. You see, it's not just a question of of say a, tra a different training, it's also that any person, one person is different from another and all of that and can enter into the dancing and with my own company uh, it seems to me there are differences, One, even though they're trained in my work so to speak, there are, there are differences one to, the, to another and when I 
give something to one I realize later that I would not have given that in that particular way to another one of the dancers. And I th think all of those are part of the possibility of life in, in, um, in a dance rather than some idea about it, it being fixed and already previously determined exactly as to how it should look. It's like expecting each flower to look exactly the same. They're not going to do it. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. um, um, who's your role models and who do you like? Who's your, who do you idolize? People you look up to. The question was, who is your role models and who do you idolize, if anyone, and who do you look up to? Oh, <laughs> Mrs. Barrett. <laughs> She would, we would, I st studied tap dancing with her, of course, and I got to be very good, but in the beginning, <laughs> she would teach us uh, tap dances in her kitchen on the linoleum. And um, I can still see her feet and hear her s sound. She made a sound with the toe and the side of the foot and the heel, and they were all different. So, and her feet were extraordinary to watch. And the, then these little kids, we'd get up and fuddle around. <laughs> and she'd get up in that marvelous, nervous way and say, no, no, that's not it. And then she'd do it. <laughs> and when, it was her spirit, though, the energy of her about wanting us to see this and how marvelous it was and to do it well, you know, not, not simply so you learn some, but really do it with well and like it. And I, I got stuck with that. <clears throat> yes, in the middle. You look on the stoicism, you know, uh, spring of the saints of modern art, and both you and John Cage are included in it. Have you thoughts on being canonized? <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a, was it a book that came out? The, a book that came out called The Saints of Modern Art, um, and both you and John Cage were in it, and she wondered how you feel about being canonized oh, as a saint. Oh, thank God I didn't read that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been called worse things. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. So, yes, go ahead. I'm wondering about your experience with um, the music after rehearsing in silence for so long. Once you're on stage or in the field or Grand Central Station and you hear the music, do you find your focus switches? Do you ever get lost in the music? Do you try to stay separate? How does that? Well, I think, of course, we've worked this way so long that. that um, in that sense, the music is an addition to the situation, but not necessarily something which, could, which uh, sort of puts the dancers off. Um, I, I think probably earlier it, it might have um, occasionally, but now we're, with, the, the, with the, the way we work, we're engendered through... You see, for example, I teach class um, without an accompanist. I, 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 there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is so I can free the rhythm um, to, to um, and change it and shift it around. Um, at the same time, I'm very strict about what the tempo is for, the, for uh, what they're dealing, but that's also another way of freeing them from being dependent upon music is what it amounts to. It's really more that, I think, so that you don't depend on that. So in the performance, you say that you would stay separate from the music? Like, no, no. Your space? Well, I, um, I think that would depend on the individual dancer, in a way, whether he or she, how much he or she listens or hears. Sometimes one, one listens more than others. Um, the, the um, and some of the scores that I know that John Cage made for us, there's no question of any kind of idea of dependency on it because of the way he, the sounds he's he has used and the way they are put together is separate enough to make you not feel uh, dependent on it in any way, and yet you know it's there. Can I add something? Sure. Like when Christian Martley was 
playing with us recently, and he did, as, as you said, that he played records, and at one point played um, some little fragment of rhythm. I think it was uh, the Spice uh, Girls, I heard. What? I heard it was the Spice Girls. <laughs> Something like that, but it was a, 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 a fragment of a, of a, 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 a melodic piece or an arrhythmic piece. And uh, one of the dancers said, you know, that it happened just as he was going to do something that was more or less in the same rhythm, and it really put him off. Because <laughs> the, the, his uh, tendency would have been to follow that, and he didn't want to do that. Oh, I, but I remember that with Chris Komar that happened, and, and he said, oh, you should just seize it, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Following up on David's comment, I would like to mention again just the absolutely um, beautiful work that you did in putting this, this, this book together, uh, 50 years of Merce Cunningham's life and work, and it really is uh, both photographically and in terms of the text is really quite a, uh, a document. Um, and I, I would really like to um, thank you all for coming and just I finish by, uh, Merce once said that dance with the kind of struggles it sometimes faces is not for unsteady souls. And I think I'd like to just say thank you, Merce Cunningham, for being such a steady soul for all these years and giving us so much. Thanks. Very much.